This is the college complexes, and uh, we will open with announcements. Uh, first, I'll let uh, some of our newcomers uh, know what the rules are. Uh, we have one rule, no personal insults. That uh, is pretty free. Uh, we try to have one person speak at a time. Uh, one fool of the dying further ado, and we will hear from our speaker. Speaking on Ayn Rand Explained, from Tyranny to Tea Party. And uh, her name is Marsha Laurel Enright. Uh, and uh, she's here with her husband. Uh, uh, Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm Red Explain. It's an, a, um, a reissue of a book from the 80s by a, an author named Ron Merrill, who was an expert on Ayn Rand's okay, ideas. And uh, and barley's delicious. I'm the editor of it. I've added about I like it. You want chicken? pages of new material, updating the interest in Ayn Rand ideas, the influence of her, and her history, and also um, revising some of the things that Ron Merrill wrote in the book originally. And it's called the Tyranny of the Tea Party because Ayn Rand was uh, born in, in Russia and was 13 years old when the Russian Revolution happened and lived through um, the Leninist period, through near starvation and all kinds of tyranny before she, before she escaped to the United States. When she came to the United States, she uh, went to California and worked in the movie industry for many, many years before she uh, established her job as a, um, her career as a fiction writer. Now, why should you be interested in Ayn Rand? I'm, I'm sure most of you have probably heard of her because she's fairly famous. Ah, who was John Galt? <laughs> exactly, who was John Galt? But one of the things that a lot of people don't know is how much her books still sell. For example, Atlas Shrugged was published in 1957, and it still sells in hundreds of thousands of copies a year. Especially since the recession started, um, in 2009, that book alone sure. sold okay. 600,000 copies. It's pretty amazing for a book that that's old, that, it, that's that is that old. And so you have to ask your... Okay. Okay. Pardon? No, I said the Bible is old, and it sells more copies, too. Well, wait, wait, one fool at a time. The Bible sells a lot of copies. Yes. I didn't, I'm not the guy that interrupted. The interesting thing is uh, there was a 1990 poll in the Book of the Month Club uh, asking which were the most influential books that people read. The first book was the Bible, and the second book was Atlas Shrugged. That's so, sad. Pardon? That's sad. So you can see that there is a question to be asked, why is she so influential? In my opinion, it's because what she provides is a vision of life in which you are given the right to live by your own judgment, not by duties or by uh, the, what other people think you should do. In, in essence, she has what's called a eudaimonistic ethic. If anyone's familiar with that, it goes back to Aristotle with the idea that the purpose of your life is to live an excellent life and to be as happy and flourishing as possible. And I think this is the kind of vision that she gives in her books. This is what calls to people and why she's been so, so influential and why she continues to sell hundreds of thousands of copies a year. <clears throat> people often get confused because she did have a book called The Virtue of Selfishness, mm -hmm. and they think that what she means by that is that you're going to do whatever you want, whenever you want, no matter uh, whether you have to walk over dead bodies to do it. But this is not what she means. She takes issue with the concept that's used in uh, English of the word selfishness, because it gives no, by having that meaning attached to that word, it gives no word of moral sanction to somebody who wants to live by their own judgment and wants to find 
what they're most happy with in life and not have to live according to duty or what other people think that they should do. And this is why she takes issue with the, with the word and, and says, no, instead it's a virtue. But she doesn't mean by that that you're, you're going to do whatever you feel like no matter how it affects other people. That's not what she means at all. Um, the, a, another controversial issue that um, she believes in is, and which is against many uh, contemporary intellectuals, is the idea of whether you can know reality or not. Is there a way to know what truth is? Is there a way to arrive at a rational conclusion about something? And She's um, quite an advocate of the idea that, yes, there are methodologies by which you can identify what's true, and you can find out um, how to act, and that there is a relationship between reality and deciding whether what, <clears throat> what, you, can, what you should do is right or wrong. In other words, there is a relationship between what is and what ought to be. And that has to do with the idea that the reason why we have values and why we need ethics is because human beings need to figure out what is the best way to live. So going back to the idea of the eudaimonistic ethic, the bridge between is and ought is that you identify what makes for the best and most flourishing human life. <clears throat> A consequence also of these ideas is the idea that human beings live by their reason. When, when you think about human beings, we are weak animals. We don't have tooth and claw. We don't have uh, specialized means of survival like a tiger or an ant or anything like that. So how is it that we are able to survive in the world? Well, the interesting thing is we don't adapt to the world and whatever's here the way that animals do. What we do is we take what's in the world and we rearrange it in order to live better. And that's a distinctive difference between human beings and animals. Now, how do we do that? Well, we do that by the power of reasoning. But reasoning can't be forced. In other words, no matter what I do to you, however I torture you, or I hurt you, there's no way in which I can actually make you think something. So, a consequence of the fact that reason needs to be free in order to come to conclusion is that human beings need freedom. Human beings need freedom to follow their own ideas, to follow their own judgment, and decide what's the best thing to do in life. And this is the basis of how human societies should interact with each other. This, in her view, and she makes many arguments for it, uh, this means that human beings need freedom in all respects, not just in per, uh, their personal life, um, not just in um, whether who they associate with, but also in the commercial realm. In other words, how we interact with each other economically. And this is one of the reasons why she's an advocate of laissez-faire capitalism. Um, Hold up for If anybody's interested, at, at some point during, during tonight, if you're interested, I did meet her back in the 70s. And I talked to her quite a bit, so if you're interested in any of those stories, I'm happy to tell you about that. And um, other than that, I guess I'll, I'll open it up to questions or comments. Yeah? Yeah, uh, she wrote to one of the uh, pollution is a violation of property rights. You got any idea what that uh, source was? Well, I think the idea there, the problem is that the pollution is caused by the problem, what's called in economics, the problem of the commons, that uh, the air is not owned by anybody in particular. And so because of that, nobody's taking care of it, and people take advantage of uh, using it as a resource in whatever way they want. Yeah, well, what, 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 you, can you think of the book or whatever she wrote it in? I think it, uh, she wrote a book called Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, and it's commented about oh, in there. Wait, wait, right. but wait, Bill, what was your question? What was your question again? That pollution was a violation of property rights. Oh. What did she say about it? Okay. I, I know the answer to the question. I know the qu answer to the question because I read Ayn Rand's book, The New Left, The Anti-Industrial Revolution. She considered the uh, environmental movement uh, a backdoor way of introducing socialism to, uh, to America. Well, isn't it? 
Well, you tell me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Who is John Galt, and why is he significant? Is this someone's brother? Uh, I was asked, who is John Galt, and why is he significant? Well, in her most famous novel, Atlas Shrugged, the plot involves a mysterious um, enforcer who gets <laughs> the greatest industrialist in the United States to disappear. Nobody knows what's going on or why, but um, it's causing the collapse, economic collapse of the country. And in the end, the, the answer is this man named John Galt. And would you like me to tell more about it tonight? Yes. I, I kind of need to to give away the plot, though, but, in case anybody hasn't read it. You, you, go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. a good book. You've either read it or you won't. Nobody yeah. wants to read it, so... Uh, <laughs> I listened to it in the car, and I found it a little long, winded, but uh, go ahead and give a little more details if you'd like. Well, in, in the story, the country is uh, at a much more advanced state of um, socialism than it is now, although... Considering what's been going on, in, in 2009, there was an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal called um, Atlas Shrugged from Fiction to Fact in 52 Years by Stephen Moore, who's an economist. And he listed the many, many ways in which what's happening now in the United States is very, very similar to what was happening in the novel Atlas Shrugged. So in this novel, at, at the point that the story opens, um, the, uh, the, the, the country is no longer run by uh, the president, he's run by a head of state. Um, the, there's many, many businessmen who are now cronies of the government, just like we have now, who are controlling what's going on in the country and preventing people who want to start new businesses or do something different from doing that because they don't want the competition. Um, one of the major characters is a woman. Now, this, this novel was written in, 19, in the 1950s, so you have to understand that this was quite a, an, a, 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 a unusual thing in the novel that um, there's a woman who's the head of one of a major, a major corporation. And she's been struggling for many years to keep this, it's a, a railroad company going um, against problems that she has with her brother, who's the president, who's actually one of the cronies of the government. Um, and the struggle is all about, should she keep going? Should she keep solving the problems of this corporation and keeping the railroads going because in this, in, at that time they were the lifeblood of the country. They were the, the way in which, this was before trucking, this was before airplanes. So this was the, railroads were the way in which goods and services were moved around the country and they were absolutely essential. And she realized if that the railroads didn't keep going, the whole economy was going to collapse. But her struggle was, should she keep doing it even though She's burdened by all these people who are, are restricting more and more what she can do, and who are telling her and the other producers how they should do what they're doing. So uh, in, the, in the course of the novel, <clears throat> you meet many of the other producers, creators, people who worked really, really hard to get where they were and, uh, and came up with new ideas, and were constantly being criticized by other people. And uh, the question was, should they keep going? Yeah. Everybody's criticizing them. Everybody's telling them they're doing things the wrong way. So maybe they should just stop. And then what happens? What, the question is, what happens when the most creative, innovative, and hardworking people in the world stop working? What happens to the economy? What happens to everybody else? <clears throat> Somebody has a question? Yes? What would your answer be to the question, what gets you when you're complaining about the criticism of the Freedom. Well, what's your answer to free speech then? We have freedom of speech. <coughs> should we have that? Of course, yeah. So we should have the freedom of speech? Uh, the question is, should we have freedom of speech? I don't understand why you think that she would be against it if she's for laissez-faire and if she's for uh, right, the rights of the individual. So what would she say when these creative class people um, say to her, well, they're criticizing me, 
what should I keep going? It's more than being criticized. It's being it's being controlled and regulated. <laughs> Not. Okay. Um, yes. Because, uh, yes. She's a great champion of individual rights, mm -hmm. supposedly. Does she champion the individual rights of individual workers to organize into unions? Absolutely not. Yes, she did, as long as they didn't get special favor from the government. Just like no business should get special favor from the government. Oh, wait, I, should I repeat the question? That, uh, this, gentleman, this gentleman said um, was she, she was in favor of individual rights. Was she in favor of the right of individuals to organize into a union? Um, I have kind of two questions. One is, could you describe the organization that you are the head of now? And second, what is your organization's position on the Citizens United decision? You mean, you mean um, the reason Individuals and in Freedom Institute, that yeah. organization? Okay. I haven't spoken about that. It's an educational organization that runs seminars to help students between the ages of 16 and 25 really develop not only their knowledge, but their ability to think well. We run them in the summer. And um, as far as a position on Citizens United, we would have no position since we're an educational organization, not a political organization. What would Ayn Rand's position be on Citizens United, do you think? Which aspect of it? Just are, are corporations individuals and thus have free speech rights and um, as individuals and uh, are able to give whatever political contributions they want to give? Well, I can't really speak for Ayn Rand, but from my own reasoning about it, corporations are made up of individuals and so they do have the right of free, free speech and they do have the right of free association. And I don't see why they wouldn't have the right to give money to the political candidates if they wish, just like anybody else does. All right. Uh, uh, Did you have a question? Yes. Uh, a, a corporation is a legal fiction created by a government. A human being is born of man and woman. Um, the corporations are a completely different kind of entity from natural persons. Uh, I, I suggest you do a little more homework. Was I wasn't okay. saying, yeah, exactly. uh, he, he was exactly. saying that a corporation is a different kind of thing than an individual, that it's a, a legal organization made by a government. And I wasn't saying that the corporation had rights, I was saying that the individuals in the corporations had rights. And so they had the right to free speech and free exactly association. Which is what was contradicted by Citizens United, which at least for now has given the rights of natural individuals to government paper, contradicting what you said a minute ago. All right. Can you get the chair back? Yeah. Yes. Do you have a pen? Uh, I, I'm very respectful of the meritocracy and this policy that I am. What, how do we balance that though with the tragedy that comes? Let's talk about Ebola right now. How do we not take care of some vulnerable people? And how, how, would, that, how would you come down on that? Well, you mean, I don't see there being a problem with taking care of people. I mean, individuals so, so can don't, make don't. all kinds of. And you ask, okay, I'll repeat for the, uh, the audience. Um, you ask the problem of the tragedy of the commons and what about the problem of Ebola and how do we take care of people who have a problem like that. Which is awful. You're, you're, so the question, the implication you have is how do we take care of that if the government doesn't? Is that what you're saying? Let's talk real blood and guts right now. Right now with the WHO being deregulated, we were lost we were lost ten we lost ten percent of the thing. We may all be impacted. Sure. Very yes. so yeah. That's the issue with the deregulation you. side of the tragedy that comments mm -hmm. comment on that. Well, my comment is that in the laissez-faire society, think of all the money that you would have that you don't have right now. You would have it, right now I'm being taxed every year 55, 60 percent, 70 percent when you consider all the taxes that I have to pay. Who is a better judge of what to do with your money? You or somebody who's in the bureaucracy? If I had all that money, think of what I could do with it. Well, I'm asking you right now because right now in terms of private sector mobilization, we haven't been able to respond to this. 
which may affect mm -hmm. seven billion people. So I think the role of governance is very uniquely in charge of some parts of human society, mm -hmm. frankly, because I'm responsible for saving lives. So that's what I think. But mm -hmm. I, I respectfully disagree. Okay, the, the, the question is, what do we do now versus what would we do if we had a deregulated economy? Well, to me, that, that seems to be what the difference is, what we're saying. The question seems to me to be the opposite. The hyperbole about deregulation hasn't really responded in terms of human outcomes. If you can give me an example of where our deregulation has improved human outcomes, I find that country too. Well, you can look at the, at the, air, the airline industry. <laughs> What, what, how people are able to travel now so much more and so much more cheaply than they were 30, 40 years ago. That would be an example. Oh, I, uh, uh, I that's wrong. Yeah. Uh, what is uh, your feeling about uh, social security, unemployment benefits? Uh, what would Ann Brandt's uh, feeling be about social security, unemployment benefits, uh, welfare, uh, Medicare? Medicare uh, Whether we should have these vehicles at all? Yes. Okay. Or, or what to do about them right now? Which are you no, asking? Whether we should have them in the first place. <clears throat> in, in the first place, no. Because in a laissez-faire economy, people would be able to keep their own money, take care of their own problems. And if they were wealthy, they could help people. In fact, the United States is probably, if you look at the stats, is the most generous country in the world. It, it, we have the most um, charitable organizations, we give the most money to helping poor people. And if I were to, able to keep 70%, 65% more of my income, I can't imagine what I could do with that. Oh. Uh, hey, I have, excuse me, I have, I have a question. Listen, uh, I have a question. Um, hey, let the Why did she do that? Why didn't she just die with her cancer and support herself? Who, who am I supposed to be answering? Uh, Laura Milstrom? All right, ask your question. No. Go ahead, ask well, your question. Well, Ann she died of cancer, and she very much took uh, government funding of uh, Medicare to, to help her out. She well, you didn't, he like, didn't ask me about what do I think we should do about it now. Well, what did he she think me, about it? He asked me what oh. whether in a lazy fair society oh. you would have that. Well, if she believed and, in that, then she should have said, I don't want that help from the government. But she took it. On the other hand, that, those were both things in which people did pay into. That's besides the point. If she truly believed in her principles, then she had her principles. Oh. One, one could disagree about whether mm -hmm. that's the logical way to decide that. <laughs> that's what you're telling us to do. Okay. All right. I don't know what you think I'm telling you to do. I'm not telling you to do anything. Lazy okay. hair. Okay, I okay. see Don Ritchie. All right. Uh, oh, all right. David. Uh, he hasn't, oh, wait, had, a hey, wait. He hasn't wait. had a chance to ask me a question. That's right, David. No, I mean, Don hasn't. Okay, Don listen. Has okay. All right. I, I wanted to, ma'am, I wanted to ask you a question about. Um, you, you, you said that Ayn Rand did, was not opposed to unions, but she just didn't want them to have any special privileges or favors from the government. Now, what, what, would, special privileges for, what would special privileges or favors for unions from the government be? Well, it would be laws which say that you have to belong to the union uh -huh. if you, uh, according to law, under a certain conditions, mm -hmm. things like that. You have to pay dues. You cross the picket line? Yeah. Okay, well, what, um, Someone else have a question? Done. Okay, no. Yes, sir. No. David? <laughs> Actually, it's Johnny. Um, I'm sorry. Two, two questions. Right. First, um, I was trying to find out what the what the meaning of the title of the lecture is, From Tyranny to Tea Party. Is there some kind of connection with the Tea Party? Everybody? And then, uh, Even here? Secondly, <laughs> if we um, accept the notion that imperialism is an extension of capitalism um, and neo-imperialism, what would Ayn Rand's position be on imperialism since it imposes its values and its order on 
underdeveloped countries throughout the world and restricts their freedom and their right of expression and economic development? Well, laissez-faire capitalism would not lead to imperialism because the government has much less influence on what's happening in the economy under laissez-faire capitalism. Um, as far as imperialism itself, Ayn Rand would be totally against it because it's not in the interest of the United States, the individuals here, and it's not um, right for any of us to use force to, uh, to uh, violate the rights of people in other countries. In the connection of, of your title? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, a lot of people in the Tea Party are very interested in her ideas. And so that's why it, so she started in the tyranny of Soviet Russia, and now her ideas are influencing people in the Tea Party today. Um, Lila Barstad? Yeah. Did you have a question? You were raising your hand. No. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Andy? Yes, um, the question I have is, uh, in a, the laissez-faire capitalist system like what you're talking about, uh, how, how would the system differ in its approach to uh, handling or uh, getting control of billionaire criminals that uh, are like big sharks, they just eat everything in sight and destroy whole societies? Uh, well, you have to be more specific about who you're talking about. I, I can't really answer something that they... Like the Koch brothers? Uh, well, okay. We have uh, billionaires currently own and run our media. And they are maintaining America in a bubble of ignorance on a variety of subjects. And the middle class is being eliminated in America. Uh, you know, uh, America is just gradually going down the drain because we are shoveling money to rich people in numbers that haven't been seen since the pharaohs walked the earth. Now, well, to, uh, the extent that, to the extent that an, a, a person is getting rich because they're getting a special favor from the government, that's wrong, and that, and that shouldn't happen under laissez-faire. Well, if, if a person has created a company uh, entirely um, without help from the government and has produced a lot of value, uh, that people are willing to buy freely, that you go out and buy, that you go out and buy, then there's nothing wrong with them owning billions and billions of dollars. Yes, you know. I've got a couple of questions. Number one, first, just college complexes. I was a fan more than 60 years ago, because I'm in the Army and I'm away from, you know, to have all about it. Continuously existed? When I heard of no, they forget. No, there was a discontinuation, uh, a dispute over taxes. Uh, 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 so there was a, a hiatus of several years. Okay. Uh, but, uh, we were revived in, uh, I think, the early 70s. Okay. <sighs> uh, but then I did have a, a, a more relevant question. Earlier you said that. <coughs> portion of your income is taken in the wide range of taxes that exist and said something to the effect that, uh, you know, who, who could use it better, you or a bureaucrat? <laughs> what I'm wondering, uh, if you're talking about an uh, unregulated society, the bureaucrat might say some bridges need to be fixed, the electric grid needs to be improved. Would you do any of that? Well, in a way, Where, how would the monies be used if they were not used by a bureaucracy that knew what the hell was being? Well, I just want to point out that I, I'll bet that a lot of you here are critics of the way that the government uses the money and the way that the bureaucrats use the money. Just want to bring that up. Yeah, but that's a very broad statement. You say you're, you're critical of this thing, you're not critical of that thing. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not being mm -hmm. too broad a brush here. Um, but in a laissez-faire society, things like roads and bridges would be privately built. They, they, they have been in other situations. We're assuming that a no, in society fact, would actually continue to progress and be able to function as well as it does now. How, how did we get cell phones, airplanes, um, flat screen TVs, robots? That wasn't by government. Pentagon research. 
Some of it was. Yeah. Some of it was. It was science plus engineering. That's right. That's right. But one, many, one many of the time. One government contractor at a time. I've got the one interrupting. Why not? That's right. Because I've been threatened. You will be. Don't worry. Get out of here. That's why not. You were insulting people. That's different. If one fool at a time. Yeah. I've got the one interrupting. Okay. Wait your turn. Yes. Wait your turn. We got plenty of people with questions, so let's get to yes. it, Brom. I saw uh, John Enright I, in the back. I did want to finish finish uh, addressing okay. your question, though, which is that we have many, many, many inventions. Yes, they they may have been somewhat influenced by Pentagon research or or NSA research or whatever, but uh, they're not a direct development of that research. They're People take that in the private sector and they use those ideas and they create all kinds of products that we voluntarily buy. <laughs> so I don't, I don't see that there would be a difference. I don't see that there would be a difference with other products too. It may not show you. What happens is one can be built by the Originally, well, before we had Pentagon research, we had plenty of scientific research. I mean, Edison was doing all this research without any government influence whatsoever. And he had a lot, a lot of, the whole electric grid was developed on that. Um, John? Yes. I, I wondered where she would stand on the drug war. Oh, she would be completely against the drug war. She, she thought that people had a right to do what they wanted with their bodies, and that uh, the idea that it's, in this essence, victimless crimes, and that the idea that the government should be taking all these resources to try to stop people from doing things that they're going to go ahead and do, and go over to other countries and interfere in other countries on that basis when our citizens are buying the products is ridiculous and wrong. So she would be totally against the drug war. All right, Judy, crowd it in. How would a totally lost interest system think of the interconnectedness so and the near catastrophe of the financial crisis just recently? Well, you know, the financial crisis, uh, you, you, she asked whether, how would a lazy for society uh, um, handle the interconnectedness and the, of the financial crisis. There is so much government regulation that's involved in what happened with the financial sector that it's hard to untangle what would have happened under a laissez faire economy. If you want a little idea about it, there's a wonderful novel called Noble House by James Clavell. You might be familiar with him. He wrote Taipan and Shogun. He's quite famous for those novels uh, of the East. Well, he wrote a novel called Noble House set in 1960s Hong Kong, which was a completely laissez-faire economy. And in it, he has a stock market run, he has a gold run, he has spies, he has every possible thing going on. And you get a little taste of what would happen in the economy and, and with things like the stock market um, under a lazy fair economy through this novel. Through the novel. All right, Charles. Okay. Okay. Yes, um, I noticed that a lot of Ayn Rand is traceable back to the philosopher Frederick Nietzsche. And that's a little disturbing, I mean, because you end up with a totalitarian society and the in implementation of social Darwinism, uh, is that the base of that she was using? Well, if you read this book, you'll find out about the influence of Nietzsche on her ideas. She started out being quite interested in Nietzsche's ideas, and as a literary artist, she loved the way that she, he expressed certain things, especially the way that he admired the heroic in man. But as she developed, she realized that many of his ideas were irrationalist and were um, pro-control, pro-totalitarianism, and she eventually rejected him as a thinker. Well, follow-up, how do you how do you preserve individual liberties if you're fostering Uberman, Superman? Well, you're, she rejected the idea that adding, supermen should control everybody else. Authority is authorizing it, aren't you? No, she said people should be left free to live the best that they can, and some people, of course, are just naturally going to be smarter, harder working, 
um, more creative than other people, and they're going to be superior in those respects. So the rich but people a, have the attributes that I'm lacking? Yes. Yes. Money. Yeah. 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 They got money. They got more money. But um, that in a laissez-faire society, they would have no more power of force than anybody else over you or anybody. Okay. I have a... Okay. Hang on. Um, Loud, please. Can you provide like a brief explanation of egoism? She was an egoist, and that's like the difference between egoism and egoism. Mm. Yeah, those those words are pretty <coughs> dicey to to uh, try to distinguish. Oh yes, I'm sorry. He wanted to know the difference between her view of egoism versus the idea of egotism. Egotism is uh, the problem is that those words, both of those words, are used often to mean people who will do anything that they feel like and hurt anybody in any way, forcefully or not. Um, an egotist especially is often thought of somebody who has to constantly be talking about how superior they are and, sh and demonstrating how much more superior they are than other people. What's interesting about that is <clears throat> a really confident and accomplished person doesn't really feel the need to do that because they get a sense of um, self-worth just from the, their very uh, ability to be competent and to create things. Um, so the kind of person she's talking about would not be an egotist. Uh, she called an egoist or an egoist ethic in the sense of that um, it's an ethic based on the idea that each person has a right to their own life, to live it as well as possible, and to use their own mind in order to figure out what how they should live. And she believed that they would help other people by Helping themselves first, correct? Uh, yeah, that in, that in the, the natural consequence of of a trading of a free market, uh, the, the the amazing thing about a, a free market that <laughs> Adam Smith noticed 200 years ago was that even though people are acting in their own self-interest, they end up helping other people because they're providing other people with things that they want in order to gain their own self-interest and to make money, they have to be concerned with the wants and the needs and the desires of other people. So it's interesting that in the course of being self-oriented, you end up having to be other-oriented. All right. Uh, let's see. I, I think, let's see, Bob Lichtenberg and uh, Doug, Doug, did you have yeah, your hand up? Yeah, I put my hand up. I was, I was I'm going to ask, uh, in Ayn Rand's philosophy, is there any kind of a safety net for people that would fall through the cracks uh, not. with uh, government uh, not being able to supply um, at least a bare minimum of uh, so, 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 substantive existence? Uh, in a full laissez-faire economy, there wouldn't be, but there would be such a, a, a plethora of private charity that I don't think it would be a problem. So you don't really? say maybe that's oh, curious. I'm sorry, uh, okay. Karen, the Fine. white will be recognized. And the next questioner is uh, Bob Lehenberg, and that's Don uh, Richard. Yes. Well, basic <coughs> question about our economic theory we take to me is, uh, you know, in our political theory, letting the individuals keep whatever they can earn, whatever they make for themselves. How is that not pure greed and selfishness? How does that become that? Well, what do you mean by greed and selfishness? Well, I'm going to keep your, all your money for yourself. Uh, I'm going to accumulate large sums of money and just, you know, you know, think it's perfectly okay for you just to um, make huge sums of money. Did that person work for their money? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did but they, they, did they so did, did they rightfully earn it? No, no my, I'm asking, isn't it greedy to keep it? Well, I want, but I want to know whether you think they rightfully earned it or not. Um, yeah, sure, they, they earned it, but it's still greedy to keep it. Why is it greedy to keep it? Because you got way too much money for yourself, and, and, and there's many other people in the world could use a lot more than, a, than a million of people could use it. How do you decide that? It's easy to decide. You see poor people suffering all over the world. I see. So you know, so if I came along and said, well, I know what to do with your money, that would be okay. Well, not, yeah, give it to, give it to, why not help poor people with your money? I think we should take all your income and do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not, I'm not filthy rich. I'm not really Why is it, selfish. so why only the rich should that be happen to? 
Uh, because they got way too much. How do you decide what's too much? Oh, come on now. That's easy. If you have millions of dollars, that's way too much. So I, so we should take the millions away from Google and not let them develop the new things. Yeah, for many, per, not which, take it which away, actually, but that person should be considered those things, others and to donate their money and to help other people. Well, they donate plenty of money themselves of their own free will, but yeah, why money. don't we take most of their money away and then they won't be able to use it to develop their new products, which in yeah. fact do a lot better to help each one of us than just giving it away to charity. No, if they gave it away to charity, they'd be helping people a lot more. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you, since you mentioned, this is a little bit of a follow-up to a prior question, <coughs> since you, um, you said that, that you would oppose, for example, conditions where where workers were required to join a union as a condition for their employment, does that mean that you support right to work laws? Right to work laws are a regulation that, or a, a law that's arisen because of the laws that require people to join unions. So to me, it's like a mess that's put on top of another mess. Well, what, what, if you uh, have what, if There's, you have laissez-faire, you, you don't have to be concerned what, what, about that. What, there, aren't, there, there aren't any laws that require people to join unions. Yeah, there are laws that require that you, you if, if it's voted into companies, if it's voted into companies, then you have to join a union ah, in the company. You have to pay dues. But that's, that's a private contract between the company and the union. I think if you look into the law about That's it, not it's a law. not. No, I think if you look into the law about it, it's not a merely private contract. <laughs> it's a it's a requirement that's set up by certain uh, state and federal only, laws. Only only to the set only in the sense that all contracts uh, are official when uh, you know when they when when they uh, have the approval of the government. No, uh, it's not it's, it's not a private contract. Yeah, it is. Okay. Well, look it up. What do you say, Charlie? Uh, please do look it up. Right. We have I'm like with you. Speaker's response. Uh, yes. Excuse me, Charlie. Um, Karen. Oh, let's see. Pat. Did you get your uh, number? Yeah. Card? You were you were talking Karen, about uh, you know can at least a very fair society a person would have by virtue right the right to produce a product they see to be in a need. If I decide to get the American patent for AK-47, and I decided to manufacture these and sell these here in a part of the world where the people there feel a need for these products, should I be allowed to do that because I I'm, I'm providing items that, if used as intended, are designed to kill people. It's called Raytheon. Well, there's a lot of things designed to kill people that we don't regulate. I mean, I could carry a knife that can kill somebody, or a baseball bat. The question is, are there certain weapons that are so uh, overwhelming, so, so much amount of overwhelming force that they should be controlled in some respect? And I don't know if I have an exact answer for this, because the one thing that Ayn Rand thought the government should be doing is organizing the um, defense of individual rights. That means from defend them, people from criminals and to defend them from foreign invaders. And so there's some weapons that <clears throat> might be reserved only for the military or the police in order to do that. I, I'm just not sure I have an answer about that. Your hand. Oh, it's no, no, no. I, I, I'm not disputing her argument on the defense of meritocracy. In fact, I support that. I think actually, though, my question for you is, people now believe we should go beyond GDPs to actually a functional happiness index, which can be measurable. You're probably aware of that. So with GDP, we're talking about production of everything, tobacco, guns, etc. And how do we dispute, and I'm asking you this on a very practical level, not a theoretical level, how do we dispute that if you look at the development indices and happiness indices, they're in areas where we've been able to kind of control crony, crony capitalism. Let me give you an example. Iceland, all of the Nordic countries, they're above us. So basically their people are buying into this. And so I'm asking you, it sort of refutes our idea of 
of isolationist uh, meritocracies. They believe people can produce in a society where we have good education, good roads, and health care, as opposed to what we have right now in West Africa, which will totally annihilate us. So the happiness indices is, is related to GDP, but it's, we now believe more modern. I just feel I'm really so not sure what your question is. The question is, give me an example of a society that's functioning in this way with a, a, a level of development that is, is at ours or about Give me an example of a society. Functioning in what way? With laissez-faire capitalism. There are, there are no uh, countries that right. are. So it's sort of an untested premise, isn't it? No, there have been, we, we did have laissez-faire or close to it in the 19th century. And what's interesting about the Scandinavian countries is that they have moved away from socialism and towards more <coughs> market capitalism. They've made some structural reforms, but by no means uh, have, there, have they... You okay. have a rebuttal period in which you have to decide how you wish to answer. <laughs> yeah. Speaker. Uh, David, can I get a question? Wait, here. Are you familiar with a book by Jerome Tuchil that usually begins with Ayn Rand? And uh, could you give an overview of that book? You know, I know that book. I know about that book, but I've never read it. So, um, but if there, is there something about her? Thank you very much. That you'd like to know something about her or history or something like that? You like that? I know about that book, but I haven't read it. I know the main <coughs> thesis is that the, the people who end up becoming libertarians, anarcho-capitalists, things like that, usually start by reading Ayn Rand. That's the main idea, but I, I don't know that much detail about it. Was there something about her or her history well, that you wanted to know? I can remember. Okay. Uh, all this right, David. Uh, I wasn't... <coughs> Wasn't Anne Rand's mission really to <coughs> remind America of our manifest destiny? By manifest destiny, I mean to <coughs> hold up the torch of leadership of individual responsibility and individualism uh, and that sort. That's not manifest destiny. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Redefined. That's you're right the that West <laughs> you're right that one of the things she was trying to do was to remind us about the values and the ideas on which the country was founded, and also <clears throat> give more justification for certain aspects of those ideas. In other words, for people's right to live their own lives the way they saw fit. Okay, Charles. Yeah, Marcia, am I correct? You oh. take. Uh, all right, excuse me. The okay. young lady over here will be next after you, Charles. Okay. Marcia, am I correct? You're taking the year 1900 to be something of an idyllic period in <laughs> history? I mean, do you think we should return to like Russia under the Tsar and China under. Well, okay, it's coming in the Republic, and before the Progressive Movement in the United States. Well, what what Karen was saying was I mean, was that was the Progressives? What Karen incorrect? was saying and was that uh, show her a country right now that exists under laissez-faire, and I said there are none that li exist under laissez-faire. Probably Hong Kong is the closest to it, but even that. Now, with the Chinese ruling it, I, I don't know if I can speak for all the details. Somalia. <coughs> Russia. Somalia. Uh, well, all right, a follow-up. Um, but what I was saying was that during the 19th century... I, I follow-up. I've just been doing research for my upcoming talk on working conditions in Asia, including Hong Kong, and is that what you're advocating? Does That's... That doesn't seem like very something we should strive for. Those factories? What I'm not sure what Asian you're Asian sweatshops? In Hong Kong. Yeah, with, with children uh, and the absence of labor law. I, I yes, under laissez faire you would have no regulation like that. 
And there's an interesting question about whether children in those situations are better off working or not working. I got to think about this? Is this the question? Well, I think if you, if you look at the whole picture of what's going on in their countries, I think it's a question you have to look into. So they're better off, make, children are better off making those products? You think you're so wonderful? Making bricks, man. Okay. Strong. The young lady uh, seated over here. What was her position on immigration? Oh, she was for complete open immigration. The only thing perhaps was to check people if they had deadly diseases or if they were known criminals. Right. <coughs> <coughs> So in that way, she was laissez-faire. Right, she was laissez-faire in that respect. She thought if somebody wanted to come here, they should be allowed to come in. I mean, that was basically our policy in the 19th century. Well, that's true. How do you feel about the enforcement of property rights, or should that be privatized as well? And what was Anne Rand's position on that? The enforcement of property rights, I'm, what, what From corporations or individuals and land claims. I uh, guess, can you tell me a little more detail of what you're talking about? Here? Well, it's been said that a lot of the basis of modern capitalism is based on the abstraction of an object. For example, you may have a, own a mountain lake, but in order to build a dam in that mountain lake, you, you gotta... You know, I'd like to listen to the speaker. Okay? And there's constantly interruptions. I'll withdraw my question until later. You sure? Yes. I think I'll he wanted to hear your question. Well, I, you know, I, I see Tim's point. I mean, I think it's much more interesting to, to, to listen to the arguments over uh, here. Please. <laughs> I'd okay. like to hear what Tim was asking. One. All right. I'll, what I'll do is I'll expound on it in the rebuttal period. Uh, We'll just leave it at that. Let's move on to the next question, okay? All right, Pat. Yeah. Uh, in this uh, utopian, let's say, fair society, who would, uh, Bill, the old Roman question, who will guard the guards? Uh, who would be in charge of police and fire? Who would be in charge of the courts, which already operate in some places on a laissez fair, whatever the traffic will bear system? Uh, and uh, who will, uh, and uh, who, for heaven's sake, uh, will be in charge of the uh, prisons? Uh, I realize there aren't too many under this system, there aren't too many people who would be arrested, uh, but for those who do get arrested, what would we do with uh, breakers of the few laws that we have left? Well, I guess you didn't, you missed what I said before about how she thought that one of the main functions of the government was to protect people's individual rights from criminals and from foreign invaders. So that is one of the most legitimate functions of the government. And in that respect, it would be a system similar to what we've had. It would, it would be uh, locally organized. We would have elections. We would have different ways in which to oversee the officials who were um, the prosecutors who were running the courts, who were the judges. You know, it's, that's, laissez faire is about the economy. It's not about who's in charge of the police and uh, the military. So who would be in charge of the military? Would there be a central government, or would this all be local? Well, you would have a central government that would be in charge of the military for the whole country, and you would have local governments that would be in charge of the police forces. I, I don't know, I'm not an expert on the military, so I don't know whether um, we have um, state uh, guards, so I mean, that's a local, more of a local military, right? Uh, well, they're a subject you call by the federal Okay, so it may be, maybe it would be, yeah. Okay. Yes. Bill Webb? Uh, did she ever take a position on the federal bank? Uh, the, the federal bank would be non-existent because it's part of a uh, overseeing of the economy through the government. Anything more specific? Yeah, banking would, it would be free banking. It would be quite a free bank. Uh, 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 uh
Ayn Rand's moral philosophy implies that if somebody wants to hurt another person and they feel it beneficial to themselves to do that, then it's morally right to do that. How would that apply to laws in the government? Uh, no, you've misunderstood the position that I was describing. Okay. Uh, the position of egoism is that each person is free to live their life uh, as well as possible by their own judgment, as long as they do not breach the rights of other people. Okay. So that means they don't use force or fraud on other people. So does she write out all of these, these rights that you, know, you shouldn't go against for other people, or is that just implied for that if you're helping yourself, you're not going to impeach on others' rights? Well, I mean, she generally agreed with the, uh, the original outline of rights in the Constitution. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Don. I okay, I, I wanted to else. I wanted to ask about a little bit more about free banking. I was kind of interested in this. Um, I mean, now would would this free banking, for example, include the uh, right of banks uh, to give out uh, subprime mortgages, uh, ninja loans, uh, liars? Uh, what what do you call Judy? Liars loans. Liar. Uh, and where where you basically where you give loans out? Let me let me finish, Charlie. Where you give loans out? To, uh, to people that are written in really dense language, in legalese, and, and the people, and the people are, are not given uh, enough time to sign them, or not enough time to read them before signing them, and then, uh, and then you take, and you give out loans to people who cannot, who, who actually cannot afford to pay the house, to pay for the house, and, and, the, and, they, and, they're, and it's an adjustable rate mortgage, uh, or otherwise known as a balloon mortgage, so that the interest rate is going to go up later on, but they, they don't know that because they haven't read the document. And then you take those mortgages, you uh, and you bundle them, tranche them, and sell them as mortgage-backed securities. And then you pay uh, you, you pay the, the the writers at Standard and Poor's to give them a higher rating. Would you consider that a a, a, a fair business practice? You know, the, a lot of these uh, instruments that have come up are a result of regulations by the government. So it's hard to understand what would happen. In I'm saying, in a way, say, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. You misunderstand my question. Let's say there's no regulation by, by the government. So this is, so in, in a laissez-faire society, would you consider this a legitimate business practice or or would you consider it fraud? Well, you, you just mentioned about 10 business practices. So what am I supposed to comment yeah. on? Well, just, just the whole thing, OK? Would that be fair or not? Just yes or no that, question. Th what is the that? What, what I just described. <laughs> you, you don't you, understand you, what I described. You asked about 10 business practices. We have to go through each crooks. one. Okay, so. Uh, crooks? Of course crooks would okay, be. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, no, uh, people, I am not passing judgment on whether the banks that, that did this, this, this actually happened. I'm not passing judgment on whether the <laughs> banks that did this are crooks or not, okay? I'm not, I'm not going there. Uh, that would be a question of whether or not the practice is any, legal or any not. Any of the practices you're mentioning are people committing fraud. Right, in any of those practices. I'm asking you. Okay, well that, no, I'm asking you. Would, well, would I, I that, can't would you it come? I understand uh, what you're, okay. uh, what you're then, so, to so you refuse question. to answer the question. We're in a, a cycle. <laughs> <laughs> Called bankruptcy. It's difficult. It's di it when is. People are not specific about what they're asking. I can't. I have trouble answering. Yeah. That was a very well, specific question. All right. <clears throat> you mentioned a number of, of cases. Uh, you might respond to one. But uh, if if somebody is pile them on rather thickly, uh, it's difficult. It if, is difficult. If any if any business person is engaging in a practice which is fraud. That is illegal. That's that is breaching the rights of somebody. So the question is, what practices are the person using, and is it does it involve fraud? In laissez-faire system, there is no such thing as fraud. Bullshit. But let me. All right. That's I just want. I, I just want to tell you. I just refers to the government. Uh, refers to the economy. I, I want to. I just there, want to tell. There still are laws in such an economy. Not anymore. There aren't. Because everything happened. This is what brought on the oh, recession. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Don, wait till the rebuttal period. Uh, later, uh, you've asked a question yeah, and she's responding to it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Margaret. It all happened. And you, you said that you spoke with Dan Brown personally at one point for a period of 
Is there any particular topic or, or part of that conversation that stands out in your memory? Well, what stood out to me was how um, she never spoke to me. I was a fairly young woman at the time. I was about 25, and she was in her 70s at that time. And she never spoke to me as if she were the great Ayn Rand and I was some minion. She always spoke to me as mind's mind. I had a lot of questions for her about her ideas, and I also had questions about how did she think Atlas Shrugged should be cast as a movie, or all kinds of different things like that. Um, and she took me very seriously. She always tried to understand what I was asking. If she started answering a question and wasn't addressing what I was asking, I would just interrupt her and I'd say, oh, I meant this, and then she would um, try to answer it as best she could. And I thought she was rather a delightful person. Which is different than some of her, uh, I had a different experience than some people have had. When she was in public, I thought she was often um, rather uh, defensive. I, you know, if, if you think about her, she was basically attacked by everyone. She was attacked from the right and she was attacked from the left. And she was in her own uh, corner, as it was. So, um, I can understand how she because I don't think she was always right to do that. I don't think she always, in public, listened to people necessarily carefully and answered them, but um, she never did that to me in private. All right. Uh, if you'll excuse me, Judy, I have a question, mm -hmm. and that is, how much is your little book? The book is $12. That's uh, not bad. Well, $20 on Amazon. Lazy. Real quick, how did you come to write the book? And why did you feel it needed to be written? And can you go through it, just a little bit of the, pr of the process Sir, of writing excuse it? Excuse me, I, I was recognizing Judy next, if you'll hold it for a moment. Okay. Okay. After. How would the system have handled countrywide, which pioneered the practice of no doc and ninja loans, which are they're basically liar's loans, because some of them don't require you to bring in documentation of your income or your assets. No income, no assets, no job, no problem. <laughs> that was not that had nothing to do with government regulation because countrywide was unregulated by most of the current regulatory system. So what would Well that's not exactly accurate about countrywide or any of the banks in the country, but let's think about what would happen in a laissez faire economy where a bank was a completely free bank. Then each each organization that was a bank would have to decide what principles they wanted to use in order to give out loans. And they would have to decide who was a trustworthy person to loan to, and they would be risking their own money on doing that. If you recall, in the 19th century and earlier, banks, uh, bankers had a reputation for uh, a gravitas, a seriousness, that you just don't hear about today. And that's because they were lending their own money, and they had to figure out who uh, would be able to pay it back. Okay. Okay. I'd like to hear... Just in a brief session, why you wrote the book, the pro just a little bit of an overview of the process of writing that book, and tell us a little more about the book itself. Me too. I'm the editor of this book. This, this book is a, an updating of a book that was written in the 80s by a man named Ron Merrill. Okay. And um, so what I added to it, I was asked by the editor of Orphan Court Press, Ron Merrill passed away some years ago, so he couldn't revise it. <clears throat> so I was asked by the editor of Open Court Press, David Seal, if I would be uh, willing to, to edit it and revise it. And what I added to it was about 60 pages of updates on her ideas, her influence, who, who um, what famous people uh, are thinking about the ideas today, um, how she's influencing the cultural landscape, how many books she's been selling, things like that, and uh, other, other developments with her ideas. <clears throat> and um, then I also went through the rest of what Ron Merrill said, and uh, I did edit some things that I thought were inaccuracies or needed to be updated. Yeah, you Okay. Yeah, Marsha, you stated that 
it's an inherent and appropriate function of government to apprehend criminals, then I guess it's okay to come and for the government to confiscate the weapons of my loony neighbor and restore public safety to my community? Well, it would depend on whether you're, he's, he's you're not loony neighbor. supposed to be apprehending criminals. Well, right? it depends on whether you, your loony neighbor, neighbor did something with the weapons that was uh, threatening or that was using force against you or other people. Well, I gotta wait till he shoots me? <clears throat> you wanna feel a thing, Joe? He threatens to shoot you. Oh. But why does he need guns if, if we've got government to apprehend criminals? Wait, wait, I, I why why does a, a person who's law abiding not able to have guns? Okay. Why? Yeah. Because they're not duly authorized to train to enforce laws or any any laws. And they're not given that authority. They don't have any qualifications. Well, what if they're not my, using, my loony neighbor? What if they're not using the guns to enforce law, but to do something else? Oh, what else do you use the gun for? Robbing banks. <laughs> Go hunting. Shoot, shoot uh, practice shooting. Shooting, shooting, shooting union members. Oh, <laughs> shoot the rats. All right. <laughs> Another environment, right? right. Yeah. yeah. Also, protect yourself from a tyrannical government. There you go. Oh, yeah. 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 Hear that, Absolutely. Charlie? You're the tyrannical right. government. Yeah. yeah. Watch out. Your only neighbor's going to defend himself from you. All right. All right. <laughs> That's baloney. To protect yeah. us from a tyrannical government. So let's suppose here in this room First tonight, to the we right. all decided that we were going to uh, get uh, Oh, a uh, Smith and Wesson 38 pistol, Don't and include me. maybe and and maybe uh, an old Springfield or Garand rifle. Uh, how will this protect us against a tyrannical government with tanks, with mortars, with several different versions of gas? Uh, I mean, you know, has there ever been a That's case since 1776 when? You know, let's let's face it. The the forces were somewhat matched at that time, rather evenly. Has there ever been a case where a bunch of people with pea shooters have <laughs> yes, overturned a government with tanks and aircraft? Yes. And all the state yeah, of the fire boys with bells and whistles. <laughs> Randy Weaver. No, he lost. Uh, Randy Weaver lost. Randy Weaver won. He took him to court. I think no, that was the problem the Soviets had in Afghanistan. Actually, the Vietnamese did it. Oh. Yeah. Well, they were supply. The Afghans were were oh, armed man. with fairly good weapons, incidentally, yeah. by That's us. Sam. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Milosevic. They had everything they wanted. Actually, the Vietnamese did it. No, they were supplied. Okay. Ho Chi Minh <coughs> Trail. Oh, 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 Tim, you have another question. Uh, just thinking maybe since the crowd is so anxious to speak, it might be a time to adjourn and to rebuttals a little early if yeah. we're ready to. Uh, since uh, the same people are uh, repeating their questions, <laughs> uh, I, I think that uh, you're right. Uh, how many think people I speak have... Up to five One, minutes, we two, got. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, oh. nine, uh, at least nine, probably ten. Can hear anybody? All right, please. Uh, and make careful notes. All right. You get the last word. Thank you again. Uh, five minutes, Brom, would be good for everybody. That was good. Thanks are good. I'm going to bring you the dessert. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I don't have any money to put in a bank. Charlie's often said he's a galactic. Uh, Portage is a 
sort of a disorganization, but there are some times so some good reasons for it, like I have tonight. Now, I think there's a big, a lot of confusion between a genuine free market and a quote-unquote free market that usually gets uh, uh, passed, passed off as. And the difference is basically a central bank and income tax and regulation that favor the larger enterprises over the smaller, push them out of business. Uh, and the poster boys for this type of uh, situation are the Koch brothers who have uh, extensive enterprises in the very fields that are developed by the uh, bank credit expansion and uh, you know they're the ones basically behind the main gripe about uh, Citizens United. Uh, I've put together a letter to Charles Koch which goes over a bunch of sources and uh, makes a distinction between a genuine free market and a quote-unquote free market. And I'm taking email addresses for anybody that wants this. I've got a couple others too. Now another little ec 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 electricity of the uh, tonight is a uh, constitutional solution to both the gun control and foreign invader uh, problems and that is to invoke the militia powers of the Congress as set forth, the militia as set forth in the Federalist Papers and uh, uh, you know that could provide both security, or domestic and foreign air defense and while keeping the guys at home, since it's unconstitutional to militia are authorized only to be called forth within the United States, within the, within the country. And uh, I think this would be a lot better way to control the carnage of private firearms with proper training and supervision and any ill uh, conceived gun grabbing which would be just another form of prohibition. Uh, uh, and so much inequality and so much brutal expensive uh, expenditures. There was a guy that had one Rolls Royce for every day of the week. And he decided every week, every day, he come with a new one, different color, something to identify as the, the different day of the week. Um, Bill. I don't think that that guy was much happier than, than anybody else except the ones who have no legs and no arms and they were just laying in the sidewalks. It was, it was really awful. 
Um, I think humanity is going down the drain. We are eating up the environment that support us. We are the most deadly virus that the, that the Earth has found. Uh, when we talk about Ebola, it's just a, it's a toy, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a children's uh, thing going on. A thousand people, two thousand people died. In, in Iraq and, and in Afghanistan and in, and in Vietnam, we killed not thousands, not hundreds of thousands, but millions of people. We are very deadly. And the sad thing is that uh, being deadly to each other, to humans, is not only affecting us, the humans, but it's also destroying the supportive uh, systems that support all life on Earth. Uh, we are going down the drain. I don't think we are going to stop. All this uh, politics, bullshit, uh, tinkering here and there, like we hear today here, it's just pure bullshit. Nothing, nothing to take care of the fundamental problem of human brutality. Yeah. That's <laughs> One day, Latif the thief captured the captain of the king's royal guard and took him away to his mountain hideout. And he stripped him naked and tied him facing backwards onto the back of the mule. And he said, here, this mule knows his way back into town. He'll take you back and, and you'll be fine. But before I let you go, I'm going to tell you one thing that you will think for the rest of your life. And the captain of the guard said, you can attack me, you can overwhelm me, you can humiliate me. My mind is my own. And Latif said, ah, but I haven't told you what that thing is. Now listen closely. I will catch and kill Latif the thief if it's the last thing I ever do. <laughs> now, real adults know that possibly the number one activity of our brain is coming up with reasons and explanations and logic to support what our emotions and our glands are telling us to do. It doesn't start in the brain, but the brain likes to think it's important, so the brain claims it starts in the brain. But an awful lot of reasons and logics and excuses and philosophies and all that other stuff is my gut says go, and, and so my brain is going to agree and explain why I should go and why it was really my brain's idea to go. And one of the very basic failings of um, these sort of emotionally retarded systems is that there is no adult maturity. There's no, no actual human psychology. There's not, nothing about the way people really work and act. In the 19th century, they had this wonderful notion they called the rational man. Well, one of the differences between the 19th century and the 20th century is the beginning of the invention of, of psychology. And I don't think anybody takes this, this, this mythical rational man seriously anymore. Um, saying, I can do whatever I want in the hell with the world feels really good when you're 17. Most people grow out of it before they're 27. Um, I, could, I could go into lots of other details about the speech, but you can't rationally discuss with somebody who simply makes stuff up as they go along. Uh, the so-called tragedy of the commons, for example, is an invention. The institution of the commons existed and thrived for a millennia, for a thousand years villages all over Europe had a commons, and it worked just fine because it was a social institution. Then we started to get new technology, and it was to the advantage of a few rich people to destroy the commons, and in a couple of years they did. It was a shift from community to institution, which uh, is, is uh, not always a gain. Um, I, I was really intrigued when the speaker said we're, we're being pushed into socialism and then gave a textbook definition of fascism. When the government is in de facto control and ownership of the 
the captains of industry. That's fascism, it's not socialism. Um, but before, even before you go to the dictionary, please, please, most sincerely, there's a book called The Wealth of Nations by a guy named Adam Smith. Please read it. The 19th century in this country was vile. It was inexcusable almost from end to end, and most of that consisted of robbing people. There were the slave owners in the South who robbed the slaves of their labor, and the factory owners in the North who robbed the wage workers of their labor. And there was open class warfare. You seem to have forgotten you're in Chicago. During the Pullman strike, George Pullman called out the U.S. Army to shoot the strikers. Not the President, not the Secretary of War, certainly not the Governor of Illinois. George Pullman called out the Army to shoot the strikers. When I see somebody on the L who looks middle-aged and they're reading something like Atlas Shrugged, I read, usually I can resist the impulse to say, aren't you a little old for that? Good evening. Uh, somebody mentioned that, uh, about guns and that with the government having tanks and gas and machine guns and everything else that it really isn't really a practical idea for anybody to have the idea that uh, guns will help us against government tyranny should government ever uh, ever become too oppressive. But the fact is that uh, while you can't point a, a, a revolver at a tank, you can very easily stick a revolver under the uh, chin of one of the commanders and tell them, call your dogs off or I'm going to pull this trigger. So uh, it, it is still very feasible uh, for individuals to have guns to be able to pre protect themselves. Furthermore, I will call to mind a, uh, a, uh, uh, a homosexual bar in New York City uh, back in the 70s that was, uh, the police were harassing them routinely. And one day, a couple of cops went in there and they grabbed them, beat the shit out of them, and took their guns away from them and chased them out. Uh, the police came back in droves, and these people in there uh, held down the fort for something like three days or something until finally, I think it was the captain of police told them, leave, go away from there, and don't bother them anymore. So once again, government can prevail. Uh, once again, individuals can prevail, or groups can prevail when government is oppressive. I could also mention the thing with Bobby Rush when that uh, there was a uh, I, I don't know it was the Black Panthers or something that was raided, and there was a shootout, uh, and it was found that the Panthers were in the right in their rights. They hadn't done anything wrong, and so on. So. Uh, Guns are very much needed by the individual to protect themselves, uh, and uh, that right should be upheld by the government. Uh, I would also mention that the um, uh, when we were when that right of gun ownership was enumerated in the Bill of Rights, it was not a right that was given to us by government. It's a right that was recognized by government, that it was a right that was held to be given to us from our Creator. All from God. Oh, so Jesus yeah. wants us all to have guns. Yeah. Uh, can I be allowed to talk, or would you rather come up here and talk? Well, I want to know Charlie? last time you talked to God. Okay, well, I want to know when you're going to let me have my say. Okay, you have the microphone, you've got your say, go ahead. No, I can't when I have this. 
So as I was saying, the, the thing is that uh, uh, this is indicative of the hard left. When, when a person who's a right winger or a capitalist will get up to talk, they get heckled. If you're in their camp, they revere you and they applaud you. Uh, somebody mentioned that Ayn Rand was a fascist. Uh, a fascist, as I see it, is very much what a, what a Nazi is. A Nazi's a fascist. And uh, the fact is, uh, Ann Rand once said, if it is ever proper for man to be on his knees, it ought to be when he is reading the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. So Ayn Rand was absolutely no fascist of any kind. Uh, Ayn Rand's father was a pharmacist, and uh, they lived, they were well-off people in, in uh, their way, in a bourgeoisie way. They were not super rich. Uh, they couldn't have been compared, let's say, to the Pillsbury's or the DuPont's, but uh, they lived well, and they had a couple of nice homes and so forth. And, when the Bolsheviks took power and took over, uh, Ayn Rand and her family were relegated to living in something like one room of the house that they had formerly owned. And uh, she wrote this metaphorically in her book, We the Living, uh, and, and how that those people had that happen. She put a lot of of the things that happened to herself and her family. And that's all I have to say. Um, I guess my, my main problem with, uh, oh, well, I have several problems. And they have to do with public services and what should be provided by uh, by the quote-unquote state and what are appropriate and needed services to be provided by the state. It, um, it is my opinion that um, as a democratic society that our government really has a, has a, uh, a solemn responsibility and we as people have a responsibility to things like public education and public health. I. Um, I know that there's this uh, this idea that somehow private enterprise is going to take care of, of education, but when we look at things like public, like uh, the difference between public schools and charter schools, which are the um, private education things that aren't really private education now, we see that the that the public the people who are not taken care of. The children that are not taken care of are the poorest children and the least powerful children. And when we look at um, education in other countries where there really isn't a developed public education, where people have to pay money, they have to pay to go to school, they have to pay tuition, that there are entire groups of children who do not go to public school, or who do not go to school, period. And so there's much higher levels of illiteracy. There's um, a much um, lower uh, standard of living. And um, the needs of people are not addressed in those societies. And that usually the places that don't pay for public education also don't pay for things like health care and all that kind of thing. So we're trending toward that, we're trending toward privatization here. And I think it's pretty appalling, actually. Because what we're doing is we're doing social triage on, on um, huge groups of our citizens. And so I'm, I'm, I look at um, the way the money goes, and I see people having wealth. But it's, um, I mean, I don't know anybody who's actually worth you know, $4 million a year, how are you worth $4 million? How do you earn $4 million a year? I can't see anything anybody does that's valuable enough. 
as an individual to earn that kind of money. So, um, I th and in addition to that, they use all kinds of public things that are done. I mean, roads and uh, public service things like electricity and water and all those things that um, are public and should be public. And, uh, and so, you know, that, that somebody is a self-made person really is a real horse cart full of bullshit because <laughs> there's nobody who really is like that. There's no one who can really say that. At any rate, um, so I think that this, um, it's the fact that we as a city are willing to, are apparently willing to let Rahm Emanuel privatize our schools uh, with all the corruption that that entails of uh, you know, who knows, payoffs, whatever it is, the incurring of political power or privilege by Rahm Emanuel, so he makes this a stepping stone to um, a national, maybe, I don't know, he's in what sort for president or something. And, um, which ought to be real interesting, him a dual citizen as president. But, um, that, that he's willing to sell out as, as as is practically every mayor in the history of the city of Chicago, willing to sell out the future of the city, that you cannot have a democracy unless you have a citizenry that is able to read, that's able to do mathematics, and that you traditionally triage the poorest, uh, the schools in the poorest communities and not put money and take money away from them that the city has always done that, the state has always done that. Um, we had a presentation a few weeks ago um, with, a, with the guy who was presenting the statistics that, and it's well known, I mean, the state took money from the pension fund, the teacher's pension fund, never paid it back, and now they're paying millions of dollars of basically interest on those loans, and that's part of our state deficit. And so the, you know, that's, we're willing to triage that, and that's um, really appalling, and we're shooting ourselves in the foot, and that's all. Uh, I am going to rebuttal myself. Uh, our speaker told us that uh, Ayn Rand's uh, theory was um, her ethics were based on eudaimonism, which means a uh, good, uh, good spirit. Uh, uh, Christians uh, believe in a good spirit, the Holy Spirit, uh, otherwise known as the paraclete or comforter, uh, and uh, see uh, Jesus as the incarnation of the good spirit. Uh, if you want to know uh, what it is to be human and uh, good-spirited, uh, they see Jesus as uh, a, a model, uh, as a definition of uh, what it is uh, to be in a good spirit. Uh, but then, Christians are very fallible people, uh, and uh, you can question them, uh, and uh, they will generally come up with different answers, uh, but uh, uh, they, they are somewhat agreed on that. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not too sure how Ayn Rand uh, compares uh, uh, in her philosophy with uh, Jesus, but uh, I, uh, uh, I, I noticed that uh, Jesus didn't found a state and was generally conformable uh, to uh, practice, though he, uh, 
obviously made had uh, uh, questions and was at odds with uh, those uh, who had him killed and uh, who were ruling uh, uh, the uh, temple and uh, uh, Jerusalem at the time. Uh, it might be interesting to make a comparison, and uh, I hope by picking up uh, uh, your book uh, that I'll be able better to do so. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, well, I'll, oh, I'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Tim, could, could you give me a one-minute warning, please? Yes, I will. Okay, great. Um, all right. Uh, my name's Don, and I used to be a libertarian. And, uh, Hello, Don. Uh, yeah, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, the, um, but what happened, I used to, when I was a teenager, um, I, I met another kid in high school who, who called himself a libertarian, and, and, and I used to have these debates with him. You know, I came, I came from parents that were, you know, kind of mainstream liberals, and, and this, was, this was back in the 80s, it was when, when Reagan was president, and so I felt that liberalism was pretty well discredited, but I wasn't quite ready to go all the way with the Ronald Reagan and the conservatives, would say, because they wanted to, you know, they wanted to have uh, first strike with nuclear war, and, and ban abortion, and outlaw marijuana, and all that, and and uh, well, it was already illegal. But but here, the libertarianism I thought was cool because then you could you could do whatever you wanted with your business, and you could smoke pot at the same time. Perfect. And um, you know, so it's the best of both worlds. And. The, uh, and, and plus, the whole thing was a perfectly self-contained philosophy. It made perfect sense. I mean, it, you know, uh, people should be free to do whatever they want with their own, as long as they don't hurt other people. At least that was, that was the idea. I, uh, eventually, as I got older, I realized that if you had this kind of, um, you know, zero government or minimum, minimum government uh, system, that a lot of things would go wrong and, um, and a lot of things in society would fall apart. Plus... Um, you know, and societies that have moved in that direction, there have been a few. I would think of Zaire, for example, uh, in, the, in the waning days of the dictator Mobutu, and, um, and probably Somalia today would be a good example of a, of a laissez-faire society. So, um, uh, I never quite got on board with Ayn Rand. I mean, my, my friend in high school was a big fan of Ayn Rand, and I, and I did try reading, I bought some of her books, I bought The Fountainhead, I bought Atlas Shrugged, uh, I bought, and I bought other books too, and I, I couldn't quite, I, I didn't finish most of these books, although I did read uh, a, a short book by her called The New Left, The Anti-Industrial Revolution. And one of the things that impressed me about Ayn Rand is that, is that she was a hypocrite. Um, and I'll give you some examples. Okay, first of all, I mean, she, um, I'll, just, I'll just tell you some of her views on issues. First of all, Ayn Rand thought that people ought to be thankful for air pollution, for without it, there'd be no industrial revolution. Yeah. Okay, second, yeah. um, and this I learned later from reading, uh, reading articles about Ayn Rand and stuff. Um, Ayn Rand actually supported the Vietnam War. Uh, so she was not anti-imperialistic. Uh, she did think, that, she did think that, that fighting communism was worth pretty much doing anything for. And she didn't, she didn't even draw the line on, on the uh, carpet bombing of civilians, if the civilians were communists. Um, now, Ayn Rand, um, she wasn't entirely consistent about being against government programs either. For example, uh, Ayn Rand wrote an essay called Apollo and Dionysus, in which, uh, which she wrote that in 1969, and in it she, she praised the Apollo space program for its scientific and, and technological achievements, uh, even though that is a program of big government. But at the same time, this is going on at the same time as the Apollo moon landing, she condemned the Woodstock conference, uh, the Woodstock concert, because, because you had a lot of people smoking weed and, 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 and taking LSD and running around naked and, and, and dancing in the mud, you know, and she didn't approve of any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And even though, really, Woodstock was an, was an act of entrepreneurship, it was a, it was, that, was, that was private enterprise at work. The guys that set it up were businessmen trying to make a buck. Um, now, uh, how much time have I got, Tim? One minute. One minute. Okay. 
Um, now, I just wanted to say also, uh, I brought up, uh, I asked our speaker tonight uh, about some of the practices. Everything I described uh, actually happened in the 2000s, and it led to the Great Recession of 2008. Now, now all of these things, this isn't a debate about what's legal or what's not legal. This is a debate about what's right or what's wrong, because I understand it. Those guys had it all right legally. Everything, there had, uh, the, the, the banking had been deregulated and, and things had been legalized to the point where, every, where there's nothing to prosecute. This is why nobody went to jail over all that. Um, so the law, you know, you say, oh, is it fraud? Well, that depends on whether the government says it's fraud. If the government doesn't say it's fraud, it ain't fraud. And if people have got enough money, they're going to buy the government and make sure that the laws are changed so that they can do whatever the hell they want. I'm going to go. First off, I am a capitalist. I believe in free markets. And I believe in the rule of law and government. My own philosophy, though, is that Ayn Rand's hands-off laissez-faire goes a little bit too far because there is a definite role for government. The question is, is how much government do you want or how little government do you want? If you want a fine example of deregulation and no government control, go to Somalia. If you want a fine example of over-government regulation and uh, too much government interference, go to the former Soviet Union or the communist country of North Korea. We don't like either extreme. I think what we really like is what kind of society do we really want. I know people work hard for their money. We like the benefits of free markets. We like the benefits of capitalism. We also like the benefits of competition. There is a way that in historically in the past that we've dealt with monopolies. And even Adam Smith, our founding father, railed against monopolies and corporatism and everything else. And it was just within the last few weeks that I found that Adam Smith was also a person who favored progressive taxation, that those who benefited the most from a society should pay the most for it. And you know something? I found out that if most people are simply fair in what they do, they're fine. I'm sure we all know of a neighbor or somebody who takes advantage of government. I can specifically remember a person that I knew real well in his mid-50s. He was all laissez-faire. He didn't believe in the income tax. He didn't believe in government. He didn't believe in anything else. Guess what happened when he turned 70? Mm. He needed medical help, and he couldn't afford the thing. So where did he go? The first thing he did was he went to Social Security and signed up for Medicare and Medicare. We have, uh, first, we have announcements. The very same thing that Ann Rand did when she found out she could not help herself. My father has always been a thing that says God helps those who help themselves. And I do tend to believe somewhat about this, but I also have a very personal example of a friend who recently lost a husband, wound up in the hospital for uh, breathing problems, and is now on oxygen for the rest of her life. And had she not had the insurance, she probably would be facing two or three million dollars in medical bills. No way she could pay for it. Now, am I to sit here and say that because I believe in a philosophy that government should not pay for health care or basic needs for a person in society? No. I think we all know what we need to do. We're the only country in the industrialized world that has this blamage of insurance problems. Most other countries, medical care is provided, like the police departments, like the fire departments, and even public schools. But I also disagree, too, that, like, for example, where I live, we've had property taxes go up almost triple in the last 20 years because of new schools, new roads, new things, and various corrupt practices of the government. I honestly think that regulation is necessary, government is necessary, 
it's how much, it's how, <coughs> what you want as a society, and there will always be those who take advantage of the system. I disagree with welfare, you know, whether it be from a person who it just chooses not to work. Do I disagree with unemployment insurance? No, because sometimes help is needed. The one thing I think that really kills me is these special exemptions and favors that industry gets, like when Walmart goes into a, society, into, a, into a place and they request all kinds of special tax exemptions for the jobs they're going to create. That to me is more of a crime than maybe some guy getting, stu you know, getting some spurious SSI benefits. If you're going to have law enforcement and government the bottom line is we also not only have to take care of street crime, we also have to take care of sweet crime. Sweet crime? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yes. All right. Uh, do I have to go? All right. Yeah, get up there. All right. <laughs> I got to set the record straight. All right. I, uh, and anyhow, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much for a very diplomatic evening. You being some of these, I'm not going to be too lengthy at this tonight. Um, regarding uh, blaze fair capitalism, on the way down here, I just discovered, reading here, that the CEOs of the 500 top companies, corporations, earned $5.9 billion in personal compensation for themselves. I, and if you took this amount of money, you could give every minimum wage employee in the United States a salary increase of $1,800. To say that a system, I'm going to embrace a system that that, folk, that it results in this incredible disproportionate concentration of wealth and power. These kind of corporations, as he was talking about here, they're purchasing, they're doing things with, with this wealth and this power. They're exercising it for their own personal benefit. It, it's, it's, I don't have to think about this as a choice. This has to be avoided. Now the other thing I heard tonight was, oh, we get such wonderful products from the free market capitalist system. On the same page, I read that Procter & Gamble is, they just decided one day, these CEOs are getting $5.9 billion. Uh, they decided to kill 100 brands that they felt weren't making them rich enough. The only thing is, and it's not in the story, is I was wondering how many people were employed making those products and what's going to happen to them. And does the CEO who makes $5.9 billion really care? No, I don't think he does. He could care less. That's not his problem. And he's under no obligation whatsoever to do so. Okay, another thing, and I, I am eclectic, I hear that Ayn Rand, somehow, I don't know the details of this story, but it appears that they took her home and made her live in one room at home. But what about the people who had no home? I think it was beneficial to them, unless, are you in favor of homelessness? <laughs> I, I, would, I would hope not. Um, the thing about this individualism, oh by the way, I like this guy that tells me, just take my gun and find the general and shoot him. That's, <laughs> I won't get into this gun issue because I haven't heard anything tonight. That sparked my interest or imagination, but um, uh, the thing about this individualism stuff is a little bit like isolationism. There's no argument, like if you take arguments, the United States should be an isolationist country. 
I, there's no argument I can come up with that that's not simpler and better in the hypothetical. Unfortunately, the United States exists among approximately 200 other countries. Now that's the realistic situation, and you better do something about it. And yes, is, is involvement, is collective action fraught with difficulties? Yes, I can give 10,000 examples where it didn't work or something of this nature. However, none of us exist in this hypothetical individual isolationism. It just doesn't exist. Now, realistically, you have to approach the situation and decide what's the best course of action here. Um, we have to curtail human activities when necessary. Uh, to say that we shouldn't, uh, unfortunately, unregulated uh, license to individuals has not proven to be the case. It, as a matter of fact, resulted in the worst mistreatment of other people that we can even conceivably think of. And it was for personal gain and profit. And people really, and you've got to be careful about coming up with intellectual arguments to justify evil. You take an evil and you can't just play like go and say, well, I'll start here and I'm going to boo 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 and over here and then it comes out of good. That just doesn't work. You're playing mind games, it's, a, it's intellectually inauthentic. Anyhow, thanks a lot. Let me know when you want to come again, now that you know the lay of the land. And thanks, David, for recommending here. Thank you. 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 No, this is somebody else. Oh. Yeah, it will be capitalist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're not for guns, are you? Oh, uh, you want to see? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're pro army. Excuse me, but I think there are probably about eight people here who have not yet uh, oh. come across. Oh, free my bus. God. And uh, if you would see me after the. Oh. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Oh, sure. We would be yeah, very I would like to come and stop you from. <laughs> 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 Get rid yeah, of them. Here, here is an example of some constructive direction and control, uh, without which, if we were a truly laissez-faire type of operation here, we would probably say, "Well, we'll leave it up to everyone on their honor to do this," without reminding people that yes, there is a three-dollar uh, uh, dues or whatever you want to call it. Uh, to sit here for the best entertainment uh, on the north side probably this evening. <laughs> I want to thank our speaker. Incredibly enough, I don't normally agree <coughs> with uh, people of the Ayn Rand persuasion, but I want to thank our speaker for giving perhaps the most rational, cogent, understandable outline of Ayn Rand's philosophy and beliefs. For a while, incidentally, this evening, I thought that I was back in the Gilded Ages. When, for, when, when, when the subject came up about kids in foreign countries working in sweatshops, and I believe if I heard it right, or correct me if I'm wrong, please, because I thought this was incredible, our speaker uh, said that, well, some would argue that the children are better off working than not working. <laughs> now, I know the argument is going to be that without the children at five, six, or seven years old working in the sweatshops, their families would starve. I know that argument. It was an argument that was made in the 1870s and 1880s right here in this country. My only response to that kind of an argument is that a society which allows that kind of stuff to go on, one day, isn't a society worth saving or surviving. Societies are judged, I don't care what your philosophy is, societies are judged by how they treat the most vulnerable people. 
the elderly, the ill, the destitute, uh, the politically misguided, uh, you know, all of these people. How we treat these people defines us as a society. Whether we're Scandinavian socialists, uh, whether we're, uh, you know, Somali warlords, uh, whether we're American laissez-faire capitalist wannabes, the truth of the matter is that we will be judged by history with how we treat the least among us. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the type of philosophy, incidentally, that in the early 1900s was necessarily being voiced only by labor organizers and by progressives and by uh, some clergy. It was being voiced by a Republican president, Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was one of the most vocal opponents of child labor. Teddy Roosevelt was one of the most vocal supporters of pure food and drug laws. Mm -hmm. Teddy Roosevelt wasn't out to tear down the system. Teddy Roosevelt, <laughs> like his cousin Franklin, was trying to preserve the system but make it a system worth saving. Yes. And we're at a kind of a crossroads in this society now. We've just gone through an absolutely disastrous economic cataclysm we still don't agree, even in this room, we don't agree on what brought it on, what should be done to make sure that it never happens again. These are questions that are going to have to be asked and answered very, very soon. But the fact of the matter is that we're at a point, we're going to have to decide what kind of an America do we want to be. Do we want to be an America where public officials can only become governors and senators and presidents if they have a lot of money or a lot of friends who have money. And if you have a lot of friends who have money who are going to bankroll your way into Congress and it costs a million plus to run for Congress, even in a nearly uncontested district today, it costs about five to ten million to run for a state's uh, a, a Senate seat, U.S. Senate seat, and I don't even want to get into the figures on what it costs to run a serious campaign for President of the United States. It reminds me a little bit of, did anyone see the movie that came out in the 1960s, The Fall of the Roman Empire? In the final scene of The Fall of the Roman Empire, the Praetorian Guard has overthrown the Emperor and the seat remains vacant. There, in the background, you hear an auctioneer taking bids. Was he taking bids for horses? Was he taking bids for slaves? No. He was taking bids for the crown of Rome. Now, most of us in this room are historically pretty savvy people. We understand what happened to previous societies and how they got that way and why they are no longer around. We have to realize the clock is ticking. I'm not normally a prophet of doom, but I understand human nature and I understand how societies rise and fall as does most everyone else in this room. We're at a crossroads. How we behave as an America in the next 20 or 20 years is going to determine whether we're here 100 years from now. And this is not a paid political announcement. I am not running for office, and I have just been told that if I don't shut up, I will be dealt with. <laughs> an article from 1983. This is an eight-page summary of a book that was called Brittle Power. It was a strategy of energy strategy for national security. And this is 1983. Amory and Hunter Lovins were commissioned by the federal government, the military, to write a study on how vulnerable 
all of our energy supplies and things are in the United States. And they said when they started, they began the study, they were not prepared for what they found initially. They said our research revealed a comprehensive denial of reality. And that's what we're seeing in America today. A comprehensive denial of reality. There's a reason that no country in the world, <coughs> their system is modeled on the laissez-faire philosophy of Ayn Rand. We're seeing just a small scrap of what that would be when you let people, when billionaires run wild thinking that, well, I'm worth 50 billion a year because I work hard. Nobody is worth that kind of money. They are not earning that money. They are scamming a system which is a wealth concentrator that steals from the middle class and the poor and shovels the money upward. We have just lived through eight years. It was 2000 to 2008. It was the greatest, most successful corporate crime spree in the history of the human race. It was called the Bush administration. Bush Cheney. It was the most successful thing. There was no failure in the Bush Cheney administration. They got everything they wanted. They ran roughshod over the Congress. They shoveled money to rich people in amounts that have never been seen since the pharaohs walked the earth. The movie The American President, there was a spot in there where Michael Douglas gets up as the president and he says, we have serious problems and that demands serious people. Well, I agree with what Pat said. Uh, this idea that you can let billionaires run wild thinking that they've earned all of their billions or mega millionaires, that idea has brought us right up to the edge of extinction for most of everybody on the human race, the human planet. Um, Naomi Klein has a new book coming out called This Changes Everything. She said the, the climate crisis is our greatest opportunity to fix our broken economic system. Uh, Tom Hartman talks about this all the time. He said, you know, taxes are what we pay to live in a civilized society. And the idea that you can run a civilized society on low or virtually non-existent taxes is a, simply a prescription for an unfair, well, like Somalia or third world countries. Uh, you know, there, there's a reason why the Scandinavian countries are succeeding, uh, because fairness is uh, figured into the way they run the country. And as Pat said, any society will be judged on, you can judge a society on how they treat the poor, the elderly, the sick, uh, the people that can't fend for themselves anymore. So. Um, and uh, there's a new book coming out, incidentally, uh, I would highly recommend it. Um, the man's name is uh, DeGraw, uh, D-E-G-R-A-W, uh, David DeGraw. The title of the book, it's going to be released September 17th. It's called The Economics of Revolution. And in that book he describes how the U.S. government and the funding, uh, the, the, the statistics they've been putting out on median income, unemployment, all that, it's been bald-faced lies for 30 years. They said we have uh, 213 adult people that could be working full-time jobs in this country, and there's 106 million full-time jobs. Fully half of this country is unemployed or underemployed, not because they're lazy and don't want to work, it's because the jobs and factories have been shut down, disassembled, reassembled overseas. Our middle class is being eliminated by the philosophy put forth by Ayn Rand. And there's a reason that Tom Hartman talks about it. Uh, every 80 years you can have a resurgence of ideas as the, the ideas of, it takes 80 years for the old people that, uh, the people that have memories to die off. And once there's no living people left that live through the, the last disaster, then this current generation is ripe to be suckered in again. So uh, that's all I have to say. Anybody wants any more information, come next week. We'll have literature on other things other than uh, the 9-11 update. Thank you. Thank you.
We have time for one couple more rebuttals, <laughs> Brown. Yeah, good, good speech. Yeah, yeah. Frank. David Ramsey Steele. Bill, didn't you give a rebuttal? No, I'd like to do uh, add a couple things. Uh, no, let's... Uh, I, no, one, one rebuttal per person. Yeah. Until we're... Okay. There's good and bad in Iron Brand, and I want to say a bit about the good and a bit about the bad. Um, <clears throat> the good thing about Iron Brand was that she was an advocate of classical liberalism and laissez-faire capitalism when it was very unfashionable. Um, I can't address every point that's been raised by some of the um, socialists, but <laughs> I, would just touch, I just want to touch on this point that's been made. People have said, where do we find laissez-faire capitalism? What I would say is this. You can see different approximations to laissez-faire capitalism and different approximations to total collectivism. And you can put them side by side where the conditions are fairly similar. East and West Germany, North and South Korea, Hong Kong and mainland China up until the 1990s. Uh, and whenever you do that, you always see the abolition of poverty in the, the countries that come closest to laissez-faire capitalism. And you always see wretchedness and misery in the countries that are furthest away from laissez-faire capitalism. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can do two things to check this. There is a lot of research done into what's called subjective well-being. In other words, measuring how happy people are. I'm quite well acquainted with a lot, a lot of that research. And what it finds is two things. It finds two interesting things. It finds that where incomes are higher, people are happier. That shouldn't be a surprise, but it's against one of the prejudices of intellectuals. But it's true. The higher the income, there's a correlation, of course, it's not true in every case, but there's a strong correlation. The other thing is this. Freedom is correlated with happiness, with subjective well-being. And the most important freedom that is most strongly correlated with happiness is economic freedom. And, you know, they disaggregated the correlations. More economic freedom will make you richer and therefore happier because you have a higher income. But independent of that, there's also the effect that just living in the midst of economic freedom makes you happier. This has been shown by SWB research. Now, <clears throat> somebody said, I'm not rich. Let me tell you, everybody in this room is fabulously wealthy by comparison with half of the world's population. So if you believe what you say, give up 95% of your income. Live on a dollar a week and have it transported out to Somalia and places like that. Is that sensible? No, it's not sensible. What is sensible is to develop what we used to call the third world, the poor half of the world, we should call it, so that they uh, attain a higher level of well-being and a higher level of happiness. And what do we find? We find if we look today at India and China, they have moved much, much closer to laissez-faire capitalism than they were 20 or 30 years ago. And what has happened? The biggest economic growth in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. That's over two-fifths of the world's population in those two countries. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, people wrung their hands in, in despair, as though nothing could ever save them from endless misery. But now you see that year by year, they're improving their incomes, they're becoming better people, more opportunities, more educated, yep. and happier because they more closely approximate to laissez-faire capitalism. That's the only reason. The United Nations cannot cure world poverty. Charity cannot cure world poverty. What is the cure for world poverty? Just one thing, capitalism. 
repetitive capitalism. This is the only thing that works, and it does work. Look at China, look at India, and you will see in practice what happens when you approximate more closely to laissez-faire capitalism. Now, that's the thing that Ayn Rand got right. I want to say something about some of the things, many things she got wrong. The biggest problem with Ayn Rand, I think Ayn Rand was a remarkable person, gifted person, and she is a major figure in popular culture. I don't think she was a great novelist, I don't think she was a great philosopher, I don't think she was a great thinker. I, I'm getting the usual signals that I better shut up, so I just say this. Her theory of ethics, I'm afraid, is um, extremely... Uh, how shall I say, it's not very well thought out, uh, because she tries to found ethics on, self on pure self-interest, and this I think is a big blunder, I think people, we have to acknowledge that people are generally very self-interested, but we cannot found ethics entirely upon that principle, and I'm forced to shut up that. No, I'm happy to go in the work on Okay. I'm happy. I can't wait. I'd like to add another minute. Well, you know, one minute to build what? Yeah, there was a program of British intelligence on Channel 11. No, another one in the series, Monday evening. And uh, it said that the uh, British intelligence trained the French resistance, which is, I think, so, is, is sort of a precedent for the 9-11 uh, inside job. And uh, I've got a quote from John Maynard Keynes I'd like to read. A short David. one. The idea of economists and political philosophers both when they are right and when they are wrong are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world was ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slave of some defunct economist. Madman in authority with their voices in the air They're distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler, scribbler of a few years back. I'm sure that the power of vested interest is vastly exaggerated compared with the gradual encroachment of ideas. Not, indeed... Bill, no, listen, your time's up. Yeah, I'm almost sorry. Come on, Bill. Darn, it's, it's a minute yeah, you're slowing up the process. Yeah. Can you finish that quickly? Yeah, <laughs> no, hold the microphone a little further away from your mouth. It's right. getting too muffled. Yeah. Uh, not indeed. Immediately, but after a certain interval. In the field of economic and political philosophy, there are many who are in, uh, influenced by new theories after. No, no, no. My new theory is after they're 25 or 30 years of age. So the ideas which 
civil servants and politicians and even agitators applying the current events are not likely to be the most recent. But to you later, it is ideas, not best interests, which are dangerous for good or evil. Oh. I didn't know I was all that. Happy. Let's thank again our speaker. Well, there are way too many issues for me to address in five minutes. So all I can say to you is read Ayn Rand for yourself and you can make up your own mind. <laughs> Um, I did want to mention one thing, and that had to do with the child labor issue. I myself, I don't want to leave sounding like I advocate that children should be in labor at all. That's, but I recognize the reality of the fact that in many parts of the world, they simply can't live without laboring. If you think about, do you think that children weren't laboring in the Middle Ages? They were laboring even worse conditions in their cottage industries. The natural, the natural condition of mankind is poverty, and it's only capitalism that has gotten us out of it. Um, if anybody's interested in discussing Ayn Rand's ideas, I have a club that has been meeting for over 20 years called the New Intellectual Forum. Just contact me if you'd like to uh, be involved. We talk about any topic that people are interested in. Um, I wanted to mention again, the book is Ayn Rand Explained. If you're interested, it's available on Amazon, or I'm happy to autograph a copy here. And if anybody's interested in my uh, seminar program, which is a transformational educational uh, experience, you can read what the students say about it here. Please contact me. Thank you. Before we go, can you give us your website? And it's, it's linked to tonight's program. Okay. There's a link on, on our website. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you. Yeah, go to tonight's program and there's a link to the end.